Good afternoon, everybody. Faltero, you're all very welcome to our webinar this afternoon. As you can see, um, a lot of people are joining us over the uh, opening minutes, so we will commence um, shortly once we have a full or a fullest complement uh, as people are logging in. We have uh, a large number of people registered for today's uh, session, over uh, 950, so thank you very much indeed for your interest in our, uh, in our uh, exchange this afternoon. And uh, people are continuing to register, and I'll just let that run uh, for a couple, uh, um, maybe 30 seconds more. So thank you very much for your patience, and we'll start presently. Good afternoon again, everybody. David Rouse is my name, multi-unit developments advisor with the Housing Agency. You're all very welcome to this afternoon's webinar. I'll share my screen uh, again, just to uh, go through some um, uh, scene setting and uh, introduction for uh, this afternoon's um, session. So a quick run through our uh, rough timetable for uh, this afternoon's uh, session. We'll have a quick poll uh, in a moment, just to understand a profile of the uh, audience attendance and who you are and where you've come from. That uh, poll will be anonymous, so we would ask you to please participate to the maximum uh, uh, possible uh, extent. I'll do a, a quick uh, five or six minute introduction uh, and some scene setting uh, around what's going on in the multi-unit developments um, sector. We'll then move on to uh, our panelists' insights on the actions for uh, uh, the actions for owners management company in Housing for All. We'll have an exchange then between the panelists with some Q&A, a combination of questions that have already come in to us by uh, email, and thank you very much for those, and uh, any questions that come in uh, via the uh, Q&A function. Uh, we'll have a, a second poll just towards the end of the session where we'll ask you to give your uh, brief feedback, and again, anonymous, so please do participate. Uh, we'll wrap up and we'll focus on uh, some key takeaways um, for the uh, for the session. Uh, other uh, housekeeping for uh, for today. Obviously, this is a webinar, so you can view only. You can contact us via the Q and A function. And if you have problems with your technology, my colleague uh, Tara Doyle uh, is available through the uh, chat function uh, to to assist you with any tech problems there. But hopefully, all will be uh, well. The session is being recorded as as advertised uh, for future use. We expect it will be posted on our uh, YouTube channel in due course, and we will email out a copy of this uh, slide deck uh, in uh, in due course. A little bit quickly about the Housing Agency. Uh, we work with the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage with local authorities, approved housing bodies and stakeholders in the housing sector across the country to promote the building of sustainable communities. And today's session is really part of our uh, engagement uh, and our uh, development of uh, thinking in the uh, in the housing uh, sector uh, being a, a center for knowledge in the housing sector contributing to the public discourse and informing the public discourse around uh, issues affecting housing so with that i'll uh, briefly stop sharing my screen and i'll uh, conduct the first poll and again we just ask you to please um, uh, respond to the question on screen which is which category best describes your involvement with the MUDS OMC sector so you should be able to just click uh, one reply and uh, again we'll run this for about 30 seconds there thereabouts just to get a good sense of our audience uh, profile so we have about 480 people um, logged in as we stand and uh, we'd be grateful if you could uh, indicate what uh, sector uh, you are associated with or what, what a, um, a category or description on screen best describes your involvement with the MUDS uh, OMC um, sector. Again, this is anonymous. We don't know uh, your reply when we don't know who replies us what, so please do feel free to participate to the maximum uh, extent. So that's great. We have about 420 over 480 uh, odd uh, participants, so that's a pretty good representative uh, sample of the uh, of the attendees and I'll share the results there and you can see that um, 
homeowners comprises nine uh, percent of the uh, of the attendance solicitors twenty two percent OMC directors eleven percent property management agent twenty two percent approved housing body six percent local authority personnel six percent other property professional nine percent accountants eight percent percent and other seven uh, percent so thanks indeed for um sharing your um, sharing your uh, uh profile if you like and we appreciate that uh, very much so i'll come back on to um sharing my screen again briefly and uh again uh, to remind you that our session today is uh, in collaboration with the uh, with the law society and we're very grateful to uh, the conveyancing committee and Fergal Ma and his colleagues and indeed his predecessor Catherine O'Flaherty for their assistance uh, and collaboration in this uh, event. Collaboration is uh, has been a feature of uh, the housing agency's uh, activity over the years, and we're grateful for for the um, for the involvement and the contribution of the uh, legal profession and, and the law society in that regard. Our panelists, who you'll hear from shortly after my quick uh, run through, uh, are uh, Suzanne uh, Bainton. Suzanne qualified as the solicitor in 1998 and is a partner with Liston and Company. Uh, Suzanne's expertise is in the uh, property uh, sector, as will be no surprise. Suzanne is a contributor to the Comple uh, Complex Conveyancing Manual and is a member and former chairperson of the Conveyancing Committee of the Law uh, Society. Rory O'Donnell, who joins us today, is one of Ireland's best-known property lawyers. He founded Rory O'Donnell & Co. in 1967. This became O'Donnell's Sweeney in 1995 and is now Evershed, Sutherland, Ireland. Rory laterally acted a consultant to the firm and he retired at the end of May 2021. He served as president of the Dublin Solicitors Bar Association, vice president of the Law Society and has been a, a member of the or consultant to the Law Society Conveyancing Committee since this was set up about, 20, about 47 years ago. So uh, moving on then to our uh, our third panellist is Paul Mooney, who is a director of Cushman and Wakefield and head of Asset Services for Ireland. Paul has worked in property management for almost 30 years and is a member of the Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland and the RICS UK. Paul served two terms on the board of the Property Services Regulatory Authority and he holds positions with the SCSI and is a non-executive director of Cluid. Uh, Paul has lectured for TU Dublin and the SCSI and he was an author, he was author and lead researcher of Owners Management Company Sustainable Apartment Living for Ireland. Many of you will be familiar with that publication um, in 2019. So thanks indeed to our panellists who we'll hear from shortly. I'm going to do a quick scene setting, context setting to inform you about what's going on in the apartments sector. So quickly some numbers around what's going on in the sector. You can see the growth in planning permissions, the green steady green line at the bottom of your screen in the red box. Uh, growth in planning permissions for apartments over the last uh, 20 years. You can see um, some numbers around dwellings approved from Q4 2019 to Q4 2020 and the orange bar uh, or the orange portion of the bar is apartments and you can see the steady uh, growth and indeed the predominance of that uh, of, of apartments as a housing type uh, over uh, later uh, more recent uh, quarters. It is important to say that not all of these apartments are the conventional build to sell model, there is the build to rent involvement there but the overall uh, the, the point is to to note the, the overall growth in the apartment sector and some firsts over the last number of years, 2019 was the first time more apartments than houses were granted planning permission. Q4 of 2020 was the first quarter where more apartments than houses were actually completed. In 2021, a quarter of all completions were apartments and that was the highest proportion um, of housing stocks since the CSO series began in 2021. And most recently, the CSO data that came out uh, that was issued last week, apartment growth in Q1 2022 uh, was 31% uh, of all completions nationally were apartments and 70% of all completions um, uh, in Dublin were, were apartment stock. So undoubtedly a huge, a huge increase in the profile of apartments there. And again, just to show you another trend from the CSO last week, uh, the completions Q1 2016 to Q1 2022, um, you can see the orange, yellow orange line there, uh, the apartment growth uh, exceeding uh, single houses and gaining rapidly on scheme houses. So again, there's more material there available from the CSO. In terms of owners management companies, we've done some quick study of, of um, registrations with the CRO and you can see a rough estimate of the, the growth in owners management companies over the last 10 years or so. Uh, so again, an increasing, uh, an increasing area of the housing sector. Uh, in terms of what the housing agency is making available to stakeholders, we have uh, lots of resources available on our website. 
we produced a guide last year with Chartered Accountants Ireland on um, owners management companies and governance. Uh, and you can get all this information on our website, on our YouTube channel, uh, available from last year, but still very current, our six sessions. And you can see them on screen there uh, for stakeholders in the MUDS sector. So they are roughly hour long um, uh, information and guidance sessions uh, on those specific topics, which would be of interest to, to sector stakeholders. And they're available on our YouTube um, channel. Other guidance that's been published of relevance to the OMC MUD sector on the uh, left hand side is guidance produced by the Office of Planning Reg of the OPR, the Office of the Planning Regulator, in relation to taking in charge. Uh, and there's material there in relation to OMCs and MUDs. Uh, and equally produced by the Data Protection um, Commission is material on um, uh, data protection considerations in relation to MUDs and OMCs. Some, some more information that has been published by uh, the Department of Housing, our parent department, is a code of practice for fire safety assessment of uh, the buildings and premises and material that's in progress and expected out following the recent public consultation is fire safety guidance for building owners and operators in section seven of that has content in relation to omc directors many of you will be aware that the work of the defects working group uh, continues in relation to the sector uh, the property services regulator which this month uh, celebrates its 10th anniversary has recently published a new customer charter supported by a customer service uh, action plan and coming close to the end of the whistle stop tour, many of you will be aware that the provision to allow virtual AGMs where not already provided for in a company's constitution was extended to the end of this uh, calendar uh, year. So many of you will be aware of that. Most recently, some research in the sector published by ourselves uh, with uh, the Irish Council for Social Housing is a study called Social Housing in Mixed Tenure Communities. And that particular report, again, all this material is most of this material is available on our website or we can point you to it but that particular report had some interesting observations around owners management companies and multi-unit developments and some of those comments will be reflected in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the um, debate and exchange between our uh, experts as we uh, as we go through so to articulate, some of you have been to our sessions before will will be familiar with the slide which tries to visualize or capture on one uh, on one page, uh, all the various actors in the in the play or in the uh, sector that is uh, the OMC and MUD sector, and sitting at it all in the centre is the owners management company, and you can see the the makeup of the owners, the directors, who regulates uh, who or who provides oversight uh, to whom in in the context of of running successful uh, OMCs and MUDs, and again just to sort of try and frame it all in one uh, in one uh, in one visual, if you like. So housing for all today's subject um, has in chapter 5.5.5 a number of actions to um, support uh, well-functioning owners management uh, companies in the state as part of uh, a key part of the um, infrastructure if you like uh, corporate infrastructure around that growing pace of our housing sector that is uh, apartments and the specific actions for housing for all that we are looking at today are 25.10 11 and 12 so 25.10 is to regulate under substance, subsection 17 of section 18 of the MUD Act to ensure that OMCs are financially sustainable. Uh, action 25.11 is to regulate under subsection 9 of section 19 of the MUD Act about sinking funds. And uh, action 25.12 is to examine the introduction of a non-statutory dispute resolution process. And again, those actions are mirrored in the Department of Justice's Justice Plan 2022, published uh, a number of weeks um, ago. I'm worth mentioning that the programme for government carries a commitment to review uh, existing management company legislation to ensure that it's fit for purpose and acts in the best interest of residents. So again, that's some scene setting around what we're going to discuss today before I hand over to our panellists. Um, it's worth just uh, looking at the detailed wording of each of the subsections in relation to service charges and sinking funds. So on screen in front of you there, we have sec subsection 17 of section 18 which says that the minister, which is the minister for justice in this case, may for the purpose of advancing the fair, effective and efficient operating of OMCs and the fair, efficient and effective management of the common areas of MUDs, make reg regulations prescribing the class or classes of items of expenditure, which may be the subject of annual service charges, the procedures to be followed in setting such service charges and matters to be taken into account in the setting of such service charges and arrangements for the levy and, and payment of such charges. And moving on then, what does subsection 9 of section 19 say around sinking funds? 
the minister again for the fair, effective, and prudent management of ONCs and MUDs make reg regulations prescribing a class or classes of expenditure which may be incurred by a fund. Procedures in setting contributions, matters to be taken into account in the setting of contributions, arrangements for levying and paying contributions, and the thresholds of expenditure by reference to amounts of expenditure or proportion of the sinking fund, which necessitate approval of the members uh, of the OMC. So again, that's a lot of uh, technical heavy language, but again, it's the nature of the uh, sector and um, having uh, articulated what the subsections say and having pointed up what the um, actions are in Housing for All, we'll move on to our panelists' uh, thoughts, which will allow me to stop uh, sharing. And uh, our first panelist, is Paul Mooney, who I introduced earlier. And Paul, over to you for your thoughts and observations. Thanks very much. David, that was um, that was a great whistle top whistle top tour. Um, I think uh, interestingly, um, I hadn't really thought about uh, the fact that we were over ten years since the Mud Act was introduced until we started looking at this and started thinking about how uh, we all came to 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 be in the same rooms each other. Um, as David alluded to earlier, the, the, the Mud Act sits with the Department of Justice, which I always thought was a bizarre place for it to sit, but it, I, I might touch on this a little bit later. But I think we were lucky from the point of view that Seamus Carroll and Michael Hoolan were the, the guys that were charged with the, the drafting of the Mud Act um, back in 2009. Um, and it took a couple of years to get there. And I think the Mud Act still remains the only piece of legislation that uh, I think it was it was the only piece of legislation passed after the um, Troika um, back in 2011. Um, and then the PSRA Act was the only one that was passed by a successive government without amendment um, later on that year. So it's, it's an interesting one. But I think we were lucky from the point of view that we ended up with um, Seamus and Michael leading the charge on this and that they did actually bring uh, the Apartment Owners Network, the Law Society, the Society of Chartered Surveyors, uh, into a room together, together with the RAI, the Engineers Construction Industry and the Department of Environment, so that there was an awful lot of collaboration that went over it. Um, the, the, the legislation was long overdue. We were um, nearly 100 years behind Finland and a good 50 years behind Australia and uh, about 30 years behind Canada on these things. Um, and I think even for all of our parts when, when the legislation was being drafted, we knew it wasn't going to be perfect. We knew it wasn't going to solve all the problems that, uh, that, 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 that are associated with multi-unit developments and owners management companies. Um, but I, I think it did deliver a lot. And uh, I think even by virtue of the fact that there's so many people, um, 567 uh, participants on this webinar now, um, it's still, it's still still quite a popular topic. Um, the, I think the last 10 years has also changed the sort of landscape that we're working in. And David touched on the idea of the number of owners management companies that are being registered at the moment. And an awful lot of those while being registered are to facilitate sort of uh, different types of tenure structures in it. And an awful lot of the time, those tenure structures are split between uh, institutional investors and um, approved housing bodies or, or, or um, local authorities um, to satisfy the part five ownership within larger estates. Um, but I think that is something that's also probably going to change as we move into the next phases of development. And certainly when we start looking at uh, work that's being done around um, encouraging home ownership um, and uh, the introduction, the reintroduction of, of affordable for sale units, um, I think we'll, we'll start seeing that um, tenure structures will change with multi-unit developments and, and owners management companies moving forward. The, uh, to touch on the ideas or on the sections that the Housing for All um, looks at in relation to, to MUDs and sort of particularly in, in, in respect to service charges, um, the MUD Act did, I think, do an awful lot around service charges, around um, bridging that uh, information deficit uh, that, that existed around how service charges were formed, how they were charged out. Um, and I think that's, that, that is something that has improved significantly in the last 10 years. Um, I think the correct use of annual reports required under Section 17 of the MUD Act has also expanded the level of information that's shared and detailed to members of owners management companies each year. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it was always clear you know, 10 years ago that there was a cultural shift needed um, around the payment of service charges in Ireland. 
um, and towards owners management companies and multi-unit developments and even the concept of apartment living um, and th this has happened to a great extent but it still does remain the single biggest issue for the operation viability and sustainability of owners management companies um, I think when when I when I did the report uh, a couple of years ago uh, there was some some sort of shocking details that came in which were uh, around the idea of I think um, developments of over 200 units but less than 500 averaged around 67 percent of their uh, debtors uh, or de debtors at 67 percent of their total turnover which if you're operating a trade and commercial company it just wouldn't be viable um you know i think the one thing that we that we often forget is that owners management companies prepare a budget based on 100 percent of recovery of service charge not 33 percent or not 90 percent um and it's it's the prompt payment of service charges and, and the collection service charges is actually the best way of keeping costs down in a management company and, the, and obtaining best value for money. The, um, while Section 1710 of the MUD Act obliges all owners to pay service charges, there remains very little incentives for owners to pay other than an awful at the time civic duty, um, but the, the penalties aren't really there. Um, I think the the civic duty element of it was was recognised um, in the inclusion of uh, service charge debt as uh, excludable debt under the Persons Insolvency Act in 2012. Um, when we sort of put to the, the Department of Justice that non-payment of service charges is a is a damage to a wider society, albeit a micro society and a multi-unit development, but it is something that when somebody doesn't pay a service charge the way that it's met in the short term is that the other owners have to have to subsidize that um, that shortfall um, or creditors one or the other um, and then when we see service charge debt being pursued we're often told that punitive interest rates uh, that would be contained in the leases aren't collectible and potentially that there's mitigating circumstances around service delivery and the bizarre thing around that is that service delivery is compromised when there isn't enough money to pay co contractors and creditors. So uh, the the idea of of improving something when it comes to service charge um, collection it really sits around the idea of uh, a, a defence resting on service delivery as opposed to um, accepting the idea that the management company is a community and it's not for profit and um, that uh, interest rates should be actually I think protected in statute that, that this should be a regulation that's introduced that uh, a level of interest rate similar to um, say the, the interest rates for late, late charges levied by the revenue commissioners would be applied um, and and generally accepted throughout uh, society as being a reasonable charge on, on top of service charge debt and not something that's negotiated or reversed out at the end of it. Um, when it comes to the sinking fund aspect of it, again, this is something where I think the, the, the understanding of sinking funds has vastly improved in the last 10 years, thanks to what is, I would probably say is the arguably the most flawed section of the MUD Act. Um, and, and this is where the confusion arises around the method of calculation of a sinking fund or contributions for it, uh, debate around what non-recurring expenditure is, and uh, suggesting that um, a new build um, doesn't need to build up a sinking fund for the first three years, as if the first three years doesn't actually impact on any wear and tear on the building. Um, I think that now that there's a certain element of learning out there, uh it's it's capable of be, becoming a little bit more robust and specific in what the demands on an owner's management company should be in relation to sinking funds and that should really sit around the idea of an obligation to prepare a building investment fund so that the owners that, that's shared with the owners so that they can actually understand what the sinking fund is going to be used for and um, what its um peak uh payment um times are going to be and and the equity around the fact that if you own an apartment for five years you should be contributing towards that five years of that wear and tear on the building fabric and and uh, and facilities so um i think the idea that an obligation on management companies to actually prepare that building investment fund to report it annually within its annual annual report and within its statutory financial statements um, as to what level what sinking fund expenditure has been incurred and what the most recent sinking fund report says the level should be at um, and how it compares to the to reality.
Um, and then where the sinking fund contribution is adopted each year when the financial statements uh, and annual report are considered so that everybody is, is in the room at the same time uh, and, and it's very much on focus. Um, I think it would be uh, helpful to um, clarify the issue around the uh, arbitrary 200 euro per unit uh, if not agreed aspect of things and move towards um, the more scientific and, and robust approach um, and that I think would also help um, sort of uh, resolve some lazy interpretations of the Act. Um, and then finally uh, the um, non-statutory um, dispute resolution aspect of it and this is one that I'm probably a little bit more uh, sort of firm on because I, I actually just don't believe it will work. Um, I think when we look at what's in place in Canada and Australia and bizarrely enough even the UK, uh, statutory dispute resolution is in place in those areas and I think when we look at the nature of owners management companies very often you don't want a situation where compromise is encouraged. So when we look at the idea of non-payment of service charges, when we look at the idea of unauthorized alterations to buildings and extreme breaches of house rules, these aren't areas where you want uh, compromise to be, um, to be encouraged. These are areas where there should be uh, a very resolute response to the idea of breaches of very clear contracts that people have signed up to. Um, and I do think that when we look around at good examples in Ireland of dispute resolution um, on a statutory basis, uh, despite its struggles since 2004, I think the RTB have now um, resolved uh, their, 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 their difficulties when it comes to this and they are now operating a very good dispute resolution process, adjudication process and, and tribunals where it is measured um, and they do um, view everything on the on the evidence that's put in front of them. So I think um, that sort of similar situation would be would be good. I think it would also be very helpful from the point of view of having uh, uh, an authority or a, a, an area of knowledge that would be able to um, deal with um, the emotions and entrenchment that very often surrounds owners management companies and its members when they do end up and when they do end up in dispute um so yeah i think that's 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 my three takes done david I hope thank you very much hopefully I didn't for, run over time sorry <laughs> thank, thanks indeed paul thank you very much for that contribution and we look forward to hearing from you again in the uh, in the interactive uh, panel discussion um, later on uh, so i might hand over now to um suzanne uh, if that's okay uh, for your uh, for your thoughts and uh, insights in the uh, in in this space. Thanks very much, Suzanne. David, thanks very much. Um, as Paul mentioned, uh, actually there was you know in terms of how the Mud Act has worked over the last uh, ten years. I mean, he's absolutely right. The engagement that the department had with the various stakeholders before the legislation came in was certainly nothing I'd come across before in terms of the engagement with the law society, and they were very open to you know changes that, that needed to be made to the initial uh, bill and there are aspects of it that have worked you know very well Paul talked about service charges um you know since since the 1st of April 2011 in any new scheme you, you, there has to be a contract for the completion of the common areas and I think that that's a that's a huge change a huge protection for management companies that they didn't have uh, before so um but to, but to focus on the three issues in the in the program for government uh, and and the changes the regulations that might be brought in in terms of the recovery of service charges um i know for management companies and the the debt collection work we would do the the main issue is the effectiveness of the uh the legal debt collection recovery process um and the issues that can come up for management companies are is it six years is it 12 years um can we recover the interest that's under the lease um uh, because often the interest rate in the leases is, is a penal rate of interest so uh there, there's a the, the the courts won't enforce a penal rate of interest and i know paul touched on that um another issue is recovery of costs some leases have a, a clause in them that allows the management company to recover in full any costs of enforcement of the lease covenants. Uh, others don't. So you're relying on the court order in terms of costs, which wouldn't always cover the, the, the full amount of the costs. 
Um, other practical issues that, that owners management companies come across is where the owner is dead or has moved abroad or the uh, unit is in receivership and there's difficulties in terms of service of proceedings. Um, and I certainly as a solicitor, it, it can be difficult to explain to, to, to an owner's management company that the receiver has absolutely no personal liability for the debt that they have to pursue the owner who's could be hopelessly insolvent and uh, uh, they, they can't serve uh, the owner or the, the difficulties in service and the, the response from the owner is well I've surrendered the property to the bank it's nothing to do with me. Um, so in terms of what the regulations might address uh, in terms of those issues um, I think it would be helpful if, it, if there was clarification on the time limit is it six years or is it 12 years um, I, sorry, I know there's an answer to that in terms of whether the document is under seal, but if there was a, a fixed time limit for recovery of service charges, uh, that, that would be helpful. Um, Paul already touched about the rate of interest, having a recoverable rate of interest and also the ability of the management company to recover the costs of enforcement uh, would be useful. Um, Issues about service, uh, whether they can be addressed by regulations, I'm not sure, but you know, the, there's an obligation under the MUD Act on an owner to provide up to date contact details. And if they don't do that, then how is an owner's management company supposed to serve proceedings on them? So perhaps there'd be a consequence if you haven't provided up to date contact details that service could be affected in another manner. Um, and also withdrawal of services where we're often asked for advice on whether a management company can withdraw, you know, parking privileges, the, 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 the key to the um, refuge shed uh, in the event of non-payment of service charges. And that involves a, a, a review of the lease and advice is to be given. Um, and I think in general, uh, owners management companies have to be very careful about withdrawing services like access to water or physical access for a tenant into the property. So if that was if there was some regulation about that, uh, it, it would be it would be good in terms of what can and can't uh, be done. Um, Early payment discounts, that's just something we're, we're sometimes asked about whether management companies can offer early payment discounts. So it might be something that would be covered by by the regulations. Um, moving on then to sinking funds, um, the, the issues that I would have come across in practice on uh, sinking funds um, would be Paul touched on our men, not even touched, mentioned uh, some of them, the non recurring expenditure. Um, if I'm asked, you know, do we have to get prior approval from the members before we do X? Um, you have to look at the section 19, you have to look at the four categories of expenditure. Only one of them, non recurring maintenance, requires prior certification and approval of the members. Why does that require approval and the other categories don't? Um, so that's something that could be uh, uh, covered by the, the regulations. And as Paul, uh, I, I've heard him say very quite correctly, there's very few items of expenditure that are non-recurring. You know, they, they mightn't recur every for every 10 or 15 years, but, but what does that mean uh, if it's non-recurring? Um, the only uh, the other one about the um, the uh, the sinking fund expenditure in turn is is how it is charged out. And again, I don't I don't want to overlap on what Paul said about the two hundred euro. Is it apportioned as per the lease? Is it the same uh, per unit? I I don't think the wording in the mud act is is that clear. So that's something that could be. Uh, clarified by uh, regulations as to what is meant there. I know that the, the section 19, there were a number of changes from the initial draft of the bill through to the act, and that might account for, for some of the, the, the fact that the wording isn't, isn't entirely clear. Um, the, the, the third topic then, uh, dispute resolution procedure, uh, this is the one I suppose I, I, I wasn't entirely clear on what I would like to say about what that should be or what that should look like. Um, certainly in terms of day to day practice, if a management comes to me and says, you know, the common areas haven't been transferred, um, there's a breach of the house rules, um, there's defects in the in the in the development and we want to pursue a remedy against the um, developer. 
there are problems with the lease documents, you know, there's a defect in them uh, or there, there's something unworkable in the documents and we want to get them changed. There often is an answer in the Act. Uh, the, the, the orders the court can make are very, very wide ranging. Um, and but the but but then you tell the client it's a circuit court application and that the, they just see euro signs and you know there's the cost of that um and certainly you know it, in issues where it, it's a it's a breach of the house rules to say to an omc client well you can go to the circuit court it it's not really a certainly it's not a cost effective remedy um uh the the, the cases um you know that involve having to change the documents um i think that they probably would need a court order uh, in order to affect that change um or in cases where the management company was applying to court to have the common areas transferred i think they they would require a court order i'm not sure that that could be you know that if there was an alternative uh mechanism that could it could achieve those uh outcomes um but, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of it is definitely a disincentive for management companies. Uh, and if there were, uh, there's no point in introducing an additional layer of costs, you know, that, that you do this before you go to court. That, that, I don't think that's, uh, that, that's not going to be helpful. But if there, if there was an alternative forum that was focused towards owners, management companies understood how they worked, um, and allowed, you know, any disputes either between the owner, the management company and the developer, our owners uh, and the management company that that, you know, that, that would be that would be very welcome. Um, the other I, I just wanted to there, there were a few uh, additional points just to make in terms of overall, um, you know, changes to, to the legislation itself. Uh, the, the 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 mud act i think uh, it's very well intentioned you can see what it meant to do but sometimes it doesn't in practice you know follow through and work all that well um and what one of the issues with it really is that there's no penalties for non-transfer of common areas uh, and i think that that could be usefully that could be a useful change uh, in the legislation um also there's a in the act the the obligation to transfer the common areas is on the developer but it doesn't pass to a successor in title i think that could be easily remedied uh, by a change uh, to the act um sections 18 and 19 aren't all that consistent sometimes when i'm asked to give advice and you drill down on the wording of the act you know section 18 talks about common areas section 19 talks about the multi-unit development and it's not clear why there's a why there's a difference um and that might be you know that might be clarified um there's a one of the remedies an omc can can look for under the act is a, an order from the developer to comply with building regulations and with planning which is very useful but is the time limit seven years the same as it is for uh, enforcement by the local authority that's something um that could be clarified and just my last point is that something i would come across in practice a lot is how does the mud act interact with the leases you know that there's the contract there's the lease and then there's statutory obligations under the mud act and how do they how do they interact is the lease to be read you know subject to the to the mud act or are they standalone or are i'm not sure of the answer but just that's something that could be addressed in any change to to the legislation that's so great that's, suzanne thanks david thank, thank you very much indeed suzanne for your for your contribution and again thanks to uh, to the, the Law Society and the Conveyancing Committee for uh, their, their engagement and providing our expert uh, panellists from the, from the legal profession. Um, uh, and the next of which, uh, the next of whom indeed is, is Rory O'Donnell. So Rory, I'll hand it over to you for your insights and uh, observations. Thanks indeed, Rory. Hi. <clears throat> the first thing I would like to say is that I, I do think that it was very helpful <clears throat> that the department talked to everyone and consulted with them regarding the, the actual MUDS Act. Now, uh, and I hope that in relation to the changes and making of regulations that they might do the same. Uh, now, most of the things that I think I 
think need to be changed probably need changes to the MUDS Act itself. Uh, the first one that I want to mention is the question of uh, fire remediation and access uh, to whose responsibility is it to deal with uh, remediation in the actual apartment, individual apartments. Uh, there's, uh, I've heard it argued that the Fire Services Act appoints, uh, effectively enables the an OMC to actually do that work. I have my doubts. I don't believe it's correct because uh, the lease documents allow very limited access by an OMC to a, an individual apartment. And the test is who is in control of the item. Well, the OMC is in control of the common areas. It is not in control of the individual apartments. So I think that there needs to be a change there just to clarify that so that an OMC should be entitled to whatever access is needed uh, to deal with any fire remediation. And if that, uh, it, that should be a statutory right. Uh, and while that is a, a fairly strong thing, it's fire remediation and that is an overriding matter as far as I'm concerned. And um, secondly, the idea of going to the circuit court for somebody breaching house rules, in my opinion, is ridiculous. Now, I agree with Suzanne that for Section 24 and such like, that the circuit court makes sense. It makes no sense in relation to simple things like to force compliance with the ability to provide contact details. Uh, and that's an important thing that an OMC needs to know. And um, also uh, enforcing house rules, it would be much more convenient and sensible and cheaper to be able to enforce that in the district court. And um, lastly, um, uh, I think a, a right that OMCs badly need is uh, when they have somebody who's not paying their service charge and the apartment is let uh, and uh, the owner collecting the rent but not paying the service charge is some a system whereby you can go to the district court to effectively direct the tenant to pay the rent to the OMC until the arrears are cleared. Uh, and there's three simple things that would improve the uh, problems that OMCs have in relation to service charge. Um, another thing would be to actually, uh, it's unclear sometimes whether one has to take legal action for service charge uh, where the owner resides. Uh, and uh, it, it, that needs to be clarified that you can either take action where the multi-unit development is or where the owner lives. Now, the, the statute already or directs that an OMC is entitled to uh, the uh, information, in other words, the contact details and any other information uh, that an OMC can reasonably require, and uh, but the people often are that there are difficulties in getting it, and that's why I say that you should be entitled to go to the district court rather than the thought of going to the circuit court or something like that, uh, because OMCs have to be very careful with the amount of money they spend and unnecessary legal actions or something that it effectively means that that entitlement is unenforceable, uh, whereas in the district court it could be done. Um, now there are difficulties and misunderstandings regarding the o OMCs uh, uh, in looking for, or managing agents I should say really, in looking for information about uh, the uh, contact details of the purchaser and who's entitled to give that. Now that's clarified by the data commissioner's uh, document in relation to that, which um, David mentioned at the beginning. And people just need to uh, be careful uh, 
if your event or solicitor happens to have the information, he's not entitled to release it or he'd be in trouble with the data commissioner. Um, in <clears throat> the question of restricting access. Now, most leases that I've seen say that the access, uh, the easements of access uh, are subject to the person, the owner paying the service charge. Uh, at the same time, the reality is that that is a very tricky area. Uh, but I would, if I was allowed to change the MUDS Act, I would try to have a situation where if somebody owes, let's say two years, that there was, uh, the OMC would have a statutory entitlement to uh, restrict access to the apartment. Um, <clears throat> Um, the section 24 uh, is very wide ranging, but I, and I've been lucky in that I have never had a, a situation where I had to make an application <coughs> under that section. But as I understand it, some of the orders that are made actually provide for the documentation, the amendments to affect the leases <clears throat> would be incorporated in a document to be signed by everyone. Now, uh, that would mean all owners and uh, there is provision to go back to the court to get someone nominated to sign if somebody refuses. But the idea in a large development to have to get every owner to sign an amending document doesn't make sense. And I don't think that uh, the, by reading the section 24, that it's, that's necessary. <coughs> I think that if the court orders the change, that it should stand alone. Uh, and um, the mediation uh, that it, the act talks about, uh, I mean, the form of mediation that's used in civil actions isn't really appropriate for that at all. And if there's to be mediation, it would have to be a different type of mediation uh, and uh, that really needs to be looked at uh, in, in my opinion. So that's the finish of my thoughts. Thank you very much indeed uh, Rory for your uh, insights and uh, observations that I think our attendees will uh, agree that we had um, some very very uh, insightful comments and observations on the uh, on the proposals in housing for all and indeed uh, proposals to review uh, management company um, legislation. It's now coming up to uh, 20 past one. We have had a number of questions that come in uh, by uh, email in advance of the session. I should say that a, a lot of the questions that have come in in the Q&A function and indeed that come in before um, by email were looking for specific uh, advice in relation to scenarios and cases that um, our, our attendees are uh, involved with. Uh, and what I would say to that is that the resources that I mentioned in our uh, in, in my earlier presentation, be it uh, the various guides, be it the recordings available on YouTube, will uh, either uh, give some direction around the issue in particular, or point you uh, in the direction of further resources to, to assist. Uh, it would be important to say that um, it's not possible for us to give direct advice over this uh, session because um, we uh, we don't have the, the full facts of a particular scenario and you should engage with your, your property professional uh, or your uh, OMC solicitor uh, as appropriate uh, who can who can best assist you. They'll be familiar with all the details with, with, with the legal documentation, the parties involved, the case history and all the all the rest of it. So so with that, a quick question uh, over the last 10 minutes just to, to bring us up to 1.30, uh, I might direct this one to Paul and perhaps you've You've dealt with it many, mainly uh, 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 in your observations, but I'll, but I'll throw it over to you. Can the panellists explain how the new legislation will ensure OMCs can recover service charges when particular owners have fallen behind on their payments without resorting to the current formula, whereby charges are only recovered when or if a sale is made? So, Paul, I might throw that one over to you. Yeah, look, I, 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 and I think I might have said when we were talking about it, we, we did talk through an awful lot of these when we were looking at the mode act as to how it would be easier to collect money and uh, the department of justice were quite firm about you know that's what the courts are there for um i i do agree with suzanne and and rory and and what i said earlier was about the idea of of there 
of there being legitimate penalties there for people not paying service charges. At the moment, there there does always seem to be this um, final solution for people where they can actually just write a check on the on the day and do a deal when it comes to legal fees and waiving interest and things like that. So I, I do think that that does need to happen. But I do think that the the process that's in the mud act the approval of service charges and um, service charge budgets at agms the um before service charges can be levied um and that sort of structure that has to be there from owners management companies to levy their service charge helps on this and it does help that cultural shift that's needed and i what i would say is it is a cultural shift that's needed this does not exist in other countries it it, it, when you look at uh, you know it, cases that go to the tribunal in Canada and the UK, very few of them are about non-payment of service charges. Most of them are about complaints about owners, management companies, as opposed to complaints about occupiers or owners within those management companies. So Ireland is somewhat unique in the idea that we just don't want to pay service charges. And probably everybody on this call and involved in this in in this process and as a stakeholder here can help in just changing that culture very good and i might open it up to suzanne or rory for any observations on that particular point we're happy to happy to move on uh, just you're both on mute there by the way just to, to flag uh, a slightly tongue-in-cheek question i suspect that has come in on the q a do any of the panelists live in or have they lived in an apartment in ireland so maybe if we raise our hands uh, around that we could certainly get a response so there we go 75 percent uh, so there's there's empathy if you like on that side and i know suzanne has empathy from her professional <laughs> experience in that in that regard um, so look, uh, apologies in terms of the um, the Q and A. We're looking at uh, coming close to our uh, coming close to our uh, wrap up uh, time. There is a question, Susanna might say, on uh, the program for government commits to a review of existing management company legislation to ensure that it's fit for purpose and it acts in the best interests of residents. Uh, any last observations around that particular piece? So that's I suppose slightly separate from housing for all. Oh, I, d I definitely think, um, David, there are, if you, I was going to say improvements to the MUD Act, but, you know, some relatively small changes that could be made to make it more effective in terms of its operation, because I know what, you know, you can go through each section and you, you know what it meant to do, you know, but sometimes just putting it into practice um, is, is easier said than done, you know, and I think the 10 years have given a lot of experience to people as to how it how it how it how it is working in practice and how it could be improved to work better for owner you know for owner for all involved you know great and rory i might throw it across to you briefly for a quick observation you're on mute there just to say yep um well i agree with what suzanne said i i, I do think that uh, the uh, uh, you know, the Act needs amendment. And I, I think that uh, things like an obligation, for example, to that somebody had to pay arrears of service charge on a sale, that would do away with and, and avoid delays because there are often arguments between solicitors and managing agents because managing agents tend to ask for an undertaking to pay service charge. And solicitors don't think that's necessary. And they, also, there are good reasons why they don't want to give undertakings. But the reality is that in every case I've ever heard of, uh, the service charge arrears is always paid as part of the closing process. But an obligation to do that would be a good thing. Great. Thank, thanks very much. And Paul, maybe just any last thoughts on that before we before we wrap it up and let people get back to their uh, get get to their lunches. No, I'd, I'd agree with exactly what, what Rory and Suzanne just said. I think, Dan's, and particularly when it comes to sales, that it is something that we see, but it is, as I'd go back to, the, the non-payment on an annual basis of 5% of the service charge, you know, turns into 50%, 60% of um, cash needed for the operation of the management company within um, within a number of years, and that's where the biggest problem comes from. It's about this build up of debt within the management companies, and I would have to say, in my experience, as, as you said earlier, David, I've been around a long time. Service charge debt 
didn't, it wasn't a problem in the 80s. It became a problem in the 90s and remains a problem now and it is around the culture around it more so than anything else. Um, but, the, you know, I, as I said, I think the MUD Act has helped on it and hopefully amendments to it now or orders under the Act can, um, can help that uh, and help us all change the culture right there. Very good. Thanks indeed, Paul. Um, uh, David, Rory, please, I could yeah. add something else. Yes. Uh, the Conveyancing Committee of the Law Society have been engaging with the Society of Chartered Surveyors about improving the pre-contract uh, queries in relation to managed developments. And we're, I think we are likely to make good progress on that, which will help the conveyancing process. But we would also like to have a, a, a statutory obligation to have a rear service charge paid on every sale. But uh, in the meantime, we hope to improve that. Very good. Thank you very much for that contribution. And Suzanne, any last comments before I close I up? Don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, what Paul said resonates with me about the cultural change because, you know, there's no immediate consequence if you don't pay your service charges, you know, so, and it's a bit of, I know it is the stick and carrot approach, but I think that's the, that's one of the main issues that has led to this, this culture, you know. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Suzanne. Look, everybody, thanks for attending. Lots of food for thought. Before we all log off, I might uh, launch our final poll for, to ask you for your quick feedback on the session. Uh, again, this is entirely anonymous uh, and, uh, we're very grateful to you for your uh, participation this afternoon. And while that poll is running, I'll also say uh, deep thanks to Fergal uh, Ma of the uh, Secretary of the Conveyancing Committee of the Law Society for his support and uh, involvement in uh, arranging this webinar uh, to uh, indeed uh, our, our panelists for their fantastic insights to Paul, to Rory and indeed to uh, Suzanne. Thanks to the housing agency uh, team, to my colleague Tara Doyle, who was ably uh, lurking in the background, making sure that uh, your questions were answered on the chat uh, and kept us kept us all uh, on track on the uh, on the technology um, technology side. Just to answer another another, another couple of uh, administrative uh, questions, we will circulate the slides. We will circulate a link to the recording. Uh, it may well be uh, next week, so please don't email in. In the meantime, be assured we have your email details and we will be in contact. Uh, in relation uh, to uh, to that. Uh, you can uh, contact us. Uh, thank you for your participation in rating the uh, webinar. We, we'll uh, share that feedback with our uh, with our panelists indeed. Uh, just to say uh, in terms of any other feedback you might have, you might uh, contact us mud at housingagency.ie. Please feel free to uh, to contact us in that uh, in that regard. Uh, and as I say, a lot of the questions that come in on the Q and A will be answered by uh, the materials that are available on our website, uh, be it the YouTube recordings or the other guides uh, and uh, and pieces of of uh, information. So with that, I think I'll wrap up the session. We're just coming up to half past one. Thank you very much indeed for your uh, engagement on the Q and A and the chat, uh, and for staying with us for uh, for the hour. We had. Uh, almost 600 attendees at one particular point. So I think that just does to show uh, and underline the um, uh, the interest in, uh, in what's going on uh, in the sector. So thank you very much indeed. I wish you a good afternoon and thanks indeed to our uh, panelists as well. <laughs>